Okay, here we are at the Pure Land. Welcome. We'll begin by uh, looking at the place of Buddha images, Buddha statues. And here at the Pure Land, I think it's a great place to study Buddha images and Buddha statues because we're surrounded by them. And if any of you have seen the other, the other hall, also loaded with Buddhas. And uh, so a question I have for you to think about is, what is the place of these Buddha images and these statues as far as our practice goes? Whether by the word practice I mean meditation, meditating on our cushion, or just our life in general. What, what is the place of these images? So there's not a right answer to this question. It's just something to stimulate our thinking. In, in my experience with these Buddha images, the first experience I had was in 11th grade reading Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse. Anybody read that? Yeah? And on the cover of the book was a Buddha image. It was a Buddha sitting in meditation. And the teacher was an English teacher. She didn't know very much, I think, about Buddhism in any formal way. And it never occurred to me that people actually sit like that. <laughs> I never saw anybody sitting like that. It was nice to see in a statue, but I didn't think people would actually try to sit in that way until, my, until years later, not, actually not too long later. And, but that image, that image of the, of the Buddha, that first image has stuck with me. And when I first met my teacher sitting in that way and explaining how to use your mind while you're sitting in that way, I thought, wow, I, I, I completely missed this. You can't get that instruction by just looking at a Buddha image, or at least I couldn't. That's not, not to say that you can't. But I couldn't, just by looking at an image, I didn't know that's what the Buddha was doing there, or that's what you do, or what you can do, how you can direct your mind while you're sitting. So one level of looking at the, or seeing images of Buddhas is it helps us to see our own potential. And it helps to remind us of the various ways that we can direct our mind. And these Buddha images, most of the ones that I've seen, have a story behind them. The one in my teacher's temple was one, it was a Buddha that was given to her. And actually, most of the Buddhas, if not all of the Buddhas that she had, were Buddhas that people had given to her, either donation or just as a, as a friendship. One, one of the Buddhas has a really just a inspiring story behind it. My teacher, when she first returned from Japan, came to United, returned back to the United States after having lived in Japan for over 20 years. She was asked to teach at a at the at a I can't remember the name specifically, but it's a it was a Quaker retreat center in Philadelphia. Since she lived in uh, the center of, of Pennsylvania, going to Philadelphia wasn't a large deal. And she stayed at this retreat center for about 30 minutes and was asked to teach anybody and everyone who came to her to teach her about Zen. And one of the people that she met at that retreat, somebody that, that was a, a Quaker, has a, had a story behind his own his own life. He was a scientist just at the time of the Second World War and he was asked to do some particular part of, uh, of, of research and he didn't know the overall picture of what he was doing. He was just responsible for one small part of it. Turns out that he was a part of the fat boy 
atomic bomb. And when he realized his part in that, he became a hobo for a number of years. He rode the trains back and forth. And this is a scientist, somebody with a deep, with, with a lot of education, working for, working, on, working for the U.S. government and became a hobo riding a train. And as he came to terms with what, or began to, one of the things that maybe helped him come to terms with what he had been a part of was finding his own unique blend of Rinzai Zen, which is another form of, of Zen, and Quakerism. He found solace in those two ways of, uh, those, two, uh, those two practices. And he gave my teacher a, a Buddha statue. And that was the statue we, we generally venerated at her temple. And so when I saw that statue, that was, and, and I heard the story, there was a connection I made with the statue. That particular Buddha had a story behind it. It came from that particular person who had this story. So it was imbued with, with meaning. These images here, the, the paintings on the, on the wall are from Evelina, one of Evelina's sons, who's an artist. And so when we see these images, we see, we see the artist, we see Evelina, we see the heart of the person. At the time of the Buddha, he expressly asked his students, his disciples, not to make any images. <laughs> he said, don't make any images of me. But today we have loads of images. If you go to any Buddhist country, you know, Thailand, Burma, Japan, Korea, China, you'll see loads of images of Buddha. So why, why did the Buddha say not to make images? And why did people make them anyway? He said not to make any images because he didn't want to be venerated. He didn't want to be seen as a, as a god, uh, but as a human being, as someone with a capacity to wake up fully. And he didn't feel like that should be venerated. At the same time, people bowed to the Buddha, the living, when the Buddha was alive, people bowed to him, not as somebody who was a god, but just at, because of their deep respect for his understanding and his compassion and wanting his blessing. It's a normal thing, like somebody who has cultivated themselves to a high degree is, has the capacity to offer spiritual energy or blessing to others. And so people feel it's a, it's a natural thing to want to bow. Over the next several hundred years, as the, after the Buddha's death, and statues were, were not being made at that time, but a few hundred years later, times began to get pretty rough in India, and people began to yearn for some signs of the Buddha. The first images of the Buddha to appear were the bottoms of the feet, the bottoms of the feet of the Buddha. And you wonder, you're like, <laughs> why would I want to see the bottoms of the feet of the Buddha? <laughs> and you see some of these images. My teacher had a, a, had a scroll at her temple with the Im images of the Buddha's feet on them. And they're ornately decorated. There's the wheel of the Dharma on one heel, and there are all kinds of symbols on the balls of the foot of the Buddha. I'm not sure of the meaning of all of them. But there's something very powerful about the bottoms of our feet. And we can make a host of connections by paying attention to the bottoms of our feet. Just in our own practice today, when we practice walking meditation, and each step we're connecting to the earth and feeling the connection of the earth. This basic function of walking can 
be a practice that helps us to really ground ourselves. So walking meditation is very central, very practical. We all do it. We all still have the capacity to walk. Walking is an amazing thing. Walking itself is a miracle. We don't know how long we have to continue walking. We didn't come into the world walking, unless you were the Buddha. And there's a story behind that where he, as soon as he came out of his mother's womb, he took seven steps. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but most of us, if not all of us, don't have the capacity to walk. And learning, watching a child begin to learn to take their first steps is really a miracle. If you if you take the time, if you have the opportunity to see that, you know, to watch, wow, the balance that's involved in walking, we take for granted once we're adults. And we and if we stop paying attention to this physical activity, we won't appreciate it. But we can relearn that appreciation just by watching a small child and, and they're stumbling. After the footsteps of the Buddha were shown, then you see other images of the Buddha start to start to appear. And in the sutras, the, particularly the Mahayana sutras, there's all kinds of uh, practices of doing bows to images of Buddhas, to statues of Buddhas, uh, to offering incense to the Buddha, to offering f uh, flowers, food, water, it just blossomed. That's, that's one of the ways that Buddhism blossomed. And so, so these Buddha images then are, have become a way to pra actually practice Buddhism. So we can practice by sitting in meditation, but we can also practice by offering, uh, uh, offering things to the Buddha. And one of the things I learned from my teacher is that a Buddha statue doesn't actually wake up until you have an eye-opening ceremony. So if you buy a, a Buddha statue at the store, it's actually, it's, it's still, in a sense, blind, or maybe even dead, or inactive. It's not, it hasn't been activated. So if you have an image of a Buddha, it's important then to activate it. You have to activate it, and there's actually an eye-opening ceremony for doing that. And once you have that ceremony, the Buddha wakes up. The eyes of the Buddha are open, and then it can work for you. It's whatever, however you understand that. But there's activity. There's, it's like having a light bulb. You know, buying a Buddha at, at the store and just placing it on an on a altar in your house is kind of like having a light bulb that's not connected to the wall. It's there, but it's not working. Once you have the eyes open, it's like it's plugged into the wall, and now it works. And there's a kind of reciprocal, re reciprocity between yourself and the statue. And so uh, when you're bowing to a Buddha, you're not bowing to something external to yourself. You're bowing to that which is highest in yourself. So you're bowing to yourself. It's just a, it's a projection of yourself out there. So that's the, that can be the potential power of the Buddha is that you're reminded of your true potential. And whenever, whenever you bow to that true potential, you are waking that up in yourself. You're waking yourself up to your own Buddha nature. So the story that I, wanted, I want to look at is in the Shobo Genzo, Zui Monkey, and these are stories that were written down by Do, Zen Master Dogen's chief disciple, Koun Ejo, in the 13th century. And the gist of the story is that there is a, a monk in a, in a certain assembly and in a time well before the 13th century that loved Buddha images. He would spend time offering incense, bowing, making uh, food offerings and water to Buddha images all of the time. Even when he was supposed to be at rest, he would be making offerings to these Buddha images. 
And his teacher got wind of this in the monastery. And you can imagine there are probably maybe several hundred monks in this monastery. And the teacher got wind of this one monk doing this kind of practice. And from an external point of view, it seems like, you know, he's a Buddhist, he's a monk. This seems to be the right practice. This, would, this is what you're supposed to do, venerate the Buddha images. The, Buddha, the teacher says to this monk, you, you, this practice won't get you anywhere. In, in the teacher's words, he says, the image and relics of the Buddha which you worship will eventually be harmful to you. <laughs> this is a really, if you think about this statement, this is really a, a kind of, you know, it, it's like saying, if you continue to worship God, God will eventually be harmful to you. Saying that to a Christian or a Jew. So it's kind of that impact. If you continue to do that, it will be harmful to you. And the monk, it says, it says the monk was not convinced. <laughs> so here's this here's the story. The the teacher's telling the monk, quit doing that. Quit worshiping the Buddha images. It's, it's going to be harmful to you. The monk is not convinced. It, and this is another aspect of, of Buddhism that I think we can't afford to overlook either. That blind adherence to what somebody is saying, even if they're in an authority figure, is not our practice. You, our practice is to find out through our own efforts or through our own understanding, through our own life experience, if what is being taught is true or not. And to disregard it if it's not being, if it's not in alignment with the way that reality is unfolding for ourselves. And so the monk has every right to not be convinced by the teacher. He's probably been told all of his life, probably since a child, that's this is what we do: is we venerate the, the, the we venerate these these images. And so to be told by an authority in Buddhism not to do that, he wasn't convinced. He had, he had um, planted the seeds within himself of this is what practice looks like, and to change that. Was, must have been really, really difficult. The master continued, This is the doing of the demon Papias. Throw them away right now. Throw the images, throw the statues, the images, throw them away. Get rid of them. Well, he, that, see, so he's seeing the monk's not, the monk's not convinced that he has to be trying to be more forceful. As the monk was leaving in anger, so again, the relationship between a, a teacher and student may not be so smooth. <laughs> There's times when a, t a student has every right to disagree with a teacher and to get angry and to and to even leave leave the the monastery, leave the, leave the temple find another teacher, whatever they want to do. That's totally okay. That They're in their right to do that. The monk got angry at the teacher. The master shouted after him, open the box and look inside. So there was a box with these, maybe a box with a statue in it. And the teacher said, okay, well, if you're not going to get rid of it, look inside. Although angry, the monk opened the box. He found a poisonous snake lying coiled up inside. So, if we think about the symbolism here, the, that which we venerate, that which we worship, if we're not careful, it can actually, in a sense, in a spiritual sense, it can kill us. We can get so stuck in an idea, even in Buddhist ideas, that they're no longer actually serving our practice. And so Dogen says, you know, it's, it's okay to 
offer Buddhas, offer vows to Buddhas, but don't think that that's necessarily going to get you to enlightenment. He's not saying don't do it, but don't be too attached to that as a practice, as if it's going to get you someplace special. If we want to, and then he, and then he further goes on to say that if you want to get some, if you want to attain enlightenment, the way to do that is through the practice of shikantaza. So shikantaza means just sitting. That's that's the practice of soto zen. And it's not. I, I would say we have to be careful there too, because just sitting isn't going to necessarily get us to enlightenment either. But if when we're practicing we're letting go of our concepts of how we think the world is. We're letting go of ideas that are no longer accurately reflecting reality. That's what Shikantaza is referring to. Whenever we're doing that, whether we're sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, doesn't matter what position we happen to be in. When we're letting go of fixed ideas, the fixed ideas are what causes suffering. Fixed ideas about ourself, fixed ideas about others, trying to control others to conform to our ways creates a tremendous amount of suffering. But if we can let go of that kind of control, allow others to be themselves, and also to open up to the possibilities within ourselves, that's what practice is referring to. And we just clarify that on retreats like this. We're using zazen as an opportunity to open up to our own habits that may no longer be serving us, our self-conceptions that may no longer be serving us. So we'll we'll, uh, continue to sit a little bit more. And let's see what comes up and see if we can let, see what, whatever it is about our own uh, life, whether ourselves or maybe attitudes towards others, or even, even the way that we perceive zazen may or may not be helpful to us. We can, our zazen is an experiment, it's, it's like a laboratory. And if our practice doesn't lead to some degree of, of liberation, some degree of opening within us, then we, ne- we may want to consider changing the experiment and finding a way of practicing that does work for us, that does help to open us up. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm.